I am a furniture maker. I guess you could say I've been a furniture maker all my life. I was born into a furniture making family. My father was a furniture maker. His father was a furniture maker. It's in my blood. <laughs> what, what would you say you love most about being a furniture maker? <laughs> what don't I love? Um, the smell, that aroma, when you, when you enter the workshop of walnut and heart pine and oak, it's the smell, it's the smell of potential, you know, like I like to just take a piece of wood and, 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 and work with it and just dream. You know, what's this, what's this gonna be? You know, who is this table or this desk or this chair going to belong to someday? What would you say is your very favorite, you know, out of everything that you've done, what is your favorite piece mm. of, of furniture? Mm. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I said, uh, uh, you know, out of everything that you've made, what's your favorite piece of furniture? Well, I, I actually have never made a, a piece of furniture. What, uh, like you've never made anything? A chair or a table or you know mm. ashtray. No. How long did you say you've been doing this? Oh, eighteen years. Okay, so in eighteen years, you're telling me you've never made a single piece of furniture? Oh, look. I mean, furniture making is is so much more than just producing things. Okay, it's 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 a way of life. Okay, th this this is this is my identity. This is what I grew up on. I mean, this is what I've invested in. That's what I that's what I think about. It's what I dream about. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. It's just it seems like if you're going to call yourself a furniture maker, that you maybe should have made a piece of furniture. <laughs> well, I didn't know we had a. <laughs> An expert in furniture making here. <sighs> well, I don't even, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually feel kind of sorry for you right now. I am proud of what I do. I will tell the world. Nay, I will shout to the world. I am a furniture. Maker. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was awkward. <laughs> when I first saw that clip, I was like, this guy's weird. And then as it all kind of turned around. But here's the thing. The truth of the matter is, when you listen to your conversations, how often do our conversations exceed what it is that we do? And by that I mean it's like we say we believe things and we are quick to voice our opinions about them. But if you sat back and analyzed what your actions are really saying, maybe our words, they go far beyond what we really believe. Maybe they're not quite as in sync with the way in which we're living. That's a possibility, right? Let me give you a, a, uh, an illustration. Um, and probably you guys are not going to like this illustration because many of us have still a ton of yard work that we're trying to get done as a result of this really harsh winter. 
but I'm going to give it anyway. According to the survey by the American Institute of Architects, 64% of architecture firms are reporting increased interest in outdoor living spaces, places for adults to relax and for kids to play. People say they want a luxurious outdoor world right in their own backyard so they can escape their everyday lives or just hang out as families and spend time outside while staying at home. But here's the thing, at, at least that's what people say they want, but there's just one problem. Evidence shows that for all of their good intentions, most families don't actually spend time in their backyard retreats. A 2012 book entitled Life at Home in the 21st Century reveals uh, an in-depth study of middle-class Los Angeles families. Researchers from UCLA recorded hours of footage while carefully documenting how families actually spent their time. And according to their research, children spent less than 40 minutes a week outside, and the adults logged in less than 15 minutes per week. 15 minutes a week. All of these families benefited from sunny Southern California weather. They had nice porch furniture. They had trampolines. They had pools. They just didn't use them. But the researchers also noted a profound disconnect between belief and action. Most families told the researchers that they were using their backyards often. But the researchers' observations proved otherwise. You see, one of the researchers noted, rather than use their outdoor retreats, people would retreat by turning on a TV, a computer, or a video game screen. People don't like this image of their lives, so they don't acknowledge it. Instead, families perpetuate the illusion of spending time outside because that's clearly the ideal. I wish I would have had this article before my wife made me go out there and invest in fixing up our backyard. <laughs> but that's true, right? You see this disconnect, like this is what we say we really want, and then we go out there and we spend all this money and energy and time, and then we hardly ever even use the thing. Here's another one. 2014 study led by Dr. Kurt Gray of the uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They did an analysis of the Save Darfur Facebook campaign. 1.17 million members had indicated that they were concerned and wanted to offer support in some way to the horrific events that were taking place in Darfur. To their surprise, they discovered that 99.8% of those who liked the page never donated to the cause. 99.8% never sent in a dime. And 72% of those never even recruited anybody in their social media circles. Dr. Gray commented on the research. He says, they raised almost nothing compared with what a similar campaign would have raised offline. The reason is that you got to look great without having to pay. Gray compares this to eating junk food. It's the equivalent of refined foods. It's engineered to make us like it, but it's ultimately empty. So despite the chorus of voices touting the transformative potential of social media, when it came to recruiting for and donating to the Save Doffer cause, the most popular network site in the world appears to hardly have mattered. Although it enabled more than a million individuals to register their discontent to the situation, it largely failed to transform these initial acts into anything that was deep or sustained in terms of commitment to the work. So you see, sometimes we say these things that we believe, and then when we look at the evidence behind it, it may not really quite support it because it may be that we have uh, an image of ourselves and our time that may not necessarily be borne out by our activity. And we're all like that. So let's just say it straight up front, like where there's all these levels of inconsistency. So there is though a, an inconvenience though about believing something. Because if you really do believe something, it should cost you. 
It means that somehow or another, there is a responsibility now that we have to act, because if I really do believe this, then it should mean something. So what are our actions really saying about what we believe? More importantly, what does God think about it? And so I put up this question in regards to our faith, then what is the faith that God really does accept? That's a valid question, right? Think about it. You're here today as, uh, to engage in a time of worship. We're all coming because, you know, we want to be better people. We, we want to know God more deeply. We want to make an impact in the world around us as well as a world within our families and friends that we travel. So that's a very important question. What is the faith that God accepts? And so to be able to answer that question, I want to look directly to the passage that's found here before us in James chapter 2. And um, so if you have a bulletin, I want you to take that out and um, you can follow along um, as we look through the notes and the passage is right there um, listed for us. James starts off this way. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Now, you see, you listen to a, a text like that, and immediately, your mind, if you've been raised in the church, you start running off in a thousand directions saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're saved by grace, not by works. So what is James saying here? James is saying, what good is it if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? I mean, that's part of this question. What is the faith that God accepts? And I think from reading a text like that, one of the things that you can deduce is that a faith that God accepts is a faith that is expressing itself in action, in, in deeds. And to bear that up then, he continues in verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. You notice here, this is relationally connected. Uh, he's talking to brothers and sisters, part of those who have identified as being part of this community of faith. It's saying that suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, then what good is it? The implication is that we're family. And as family, we ought to be in touch with one another. You know, um, my mom passed uh, almost two years ago now. And um, maybe today's, my, you know, because of Mother's Day or something and the funeral I did yesterday. But I started thinking about all those moments that I had with my mom. And in connection to this passage about being relationally connected, I was in my middle 20s. And um, I remember I, I was not a believer at the time. And... Um, my mom and dad, they had made a profession of faith later in their life. And so, um, but my life consisted mainly of working and going out dancing at all the clubs. In fact, uh, Newport uh, Jazz Festivals, the Newport Jazz Festival sponsored Newport Dance Festivals over many of the cities. And I won those for doing the Latin hustle back in the day. So that was what my life was about. I mean, that's why I tell people I baptize so well because I got that dip thing down, you know? <laughs> so uh, me and Donna Summers, man, we were pretty tight back in the day. Within six months of though, I, I wound up getting saved and wound up going to seminary where I didn't have a clue what was going on because I didn't grow up in a church. I didn't have any background whatsoever. I didn't know anything about the Bible but I was hungry. But on this particular day, I remember coming home and um, I had this apartment in the city, but I would make this, you know, kind of wherever I had, wherever I was closest. So I, I came to my parents' house that day, raided their refrigerator, ran upstairs to change and get some new clothes. And I was on my way out again. And my mom, while I was upstairs, had stationed herself near the front door and was waiting for me. And um, when, I, when I came down the stairs, she looked at me and she said, don't you love me anymore? 
And it got about as quiet as it is here right now. And I'm like, Mom, man, you know I love you. Like, why, why are you even asking me that? She says, because you never want to spend time here anymore. Like, you're always running out, and you come here, and you treat this house like it's a hotel. I remember kind of walking away from that conversation, getting on a train. And thinking, I really hurt my mom. James is saying that we're a family of God. And we could live together in such a way that we're not even consciously aware of the needs of our very brothers and sisters in the faith that are around us. That there's a disregard to that. It's only about me and mine, and I'm in and I'm out. And somewhere in that process, if we were to engage in people and casually, you're just like, hey, God bless you, man. I hope hope things go well, which is the equivalent of saying, be filled and be warm when the person is lacking. You see, it's, it's implied that in these actions that are motivated by our faith, They ought to be relationally connected. And the other thing here is that they ought to be attuned to people's physical needs. Notice it says, it says, if you do nothing about his physical needs, then what good is it? So all this talk about faith and love and everything, if you don't act on it, it says it's worth nothing. And then comes a warning. It says in the same way, faith with by itself, if it's if it's not accompanied by action, is what? It's dead. It's not that it's a little bit dead. It says it's dead. It, It it doesn't amount to anything. There's no life to that. See, we have the trappings of that. We're like our furniture maker. I love the smell of the wood. We might enjoy those trappings about faith, but when it comes to really energizing us and causing us to do something, not so much. And so the warning comes that it's it's dead. So James turns around, he says in verse uh, 2, verse 18, he says, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. See, I think what what James is getting to in that little passage right there is saying that if the faith that God accepts is not only a faith that is accompanied by action, but it's also a faith that is more than an adherence to a creed. And the reason why I say that is, you see, faith that's expressed only by a creed will not produce the righteousness that God desires. That's the truth. It's not going to produce the righteousness. So you could say, I believe something, but the only way it really achieves the righteousness that God wants is if I am engaged, that I am doing something. And the reason why I say this regarding a creed is because of this. When, when James says, you say that you believe in one God, well, any Jew that would have been living in this day would have immediately understood that remark as coming from Deuteronomy chapter 6, what every single uh, um, person in, in this Jewish community would have learned as the Shema. They learned it in their, uh, in their bar mitzvahs. They, they, they learned that in their services. They would recite it from memory. And all it said was this in Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And it separated them from all the other cults and everything that were around them that uh, that worshiped multiple gods. But no, for 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 the Jew, they recognized that there was one God who made the heavens and the earth, gave life to all people. From one God, all the family of earth has come. So they would declare that in their meetings. Behold, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. In fact, when Jesus was doing his ministry, 
They came to him and said, what's the greatest commandment? And you know what he said back in Mark chapter 12? He said this, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And thou shalt love him with all of thy heart, with all of thy mind, with all of thy soul, with all of thy strength. And the, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. See, even Jesus understood that there was this this acknowledgement of this creed that all of the nation of Israel would adhere to, but it wasn't enough just to say it. Faith has to go beyond just an adherence to a creed. It's not just saying that I believe something and then my actions are completely absent. Listen, as one writer puts it this way, uh, Professor Perkins says, look, faith without works spares individuals the embarrassment of radical disruption in their lives or relationships. The danger becomes evident in this example. People will not remember their obligations to Christian brothers and sisters. Our churches today contain many people who agree with the imaginary challenger here in James. Not only does faith not require any relationships or obligations to others, but any suggestion that it does is met with resistance. Twice as many Americans explicitly claim to be members of churches or synagogues as actually participate in those activities of those groups. Today, many Christians run the risk of thinking that faith means nothing more than private individual views. How many times have you had conversations with people like that where they say, well, my faith is very private. Even the commitment to gather with others to worship regularly seems unnecessary to some. James would certainly wonder if faith without community could survive. That's why he calls them brothers. That's why in, throughout this whole passage, even though he has some really hard things to say, it's always couched with, my dear brothers. I kind of think of like my mom who was always like kind of, you know, uh, coaxing me to do the right things. You see, then there is this warning that comes. And the warning is that faith of this kind is gonna be judged. It says, you say you believe in one God, you do great. But you do know that the devil believes that and they shudder. And why do they shudder? Because they know that they're gonna be judged for it. So what kind of response does it have for us? If my faith is nothing more than just lip service to a creed, and if I look at my life and there doesn't seem to be any actions that are really being motivated out of that faith, it should begin to make us a little uneasy. See, in verse 20, it says, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Now, verse 20 is, a, is, a, is an interesting verse because the Greek words that they use here are play on words. So it says, the text could literally be read this way. It says, faith that doesn't work without deeds, right? Because it's, it's it comes from two Greek words, the alpha negative, A, and then the word for work. So it's... Um, it doesn't work or uh, not working. So a faith not working is not working, <laughs> is what the text is. Because the word for useless and the word for it that's translated without deeds is the same words. So it's faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. Now what James is contrasting for us here is a non-working, inactive faith which cannot save us in the judgment over against a working faith, which can save. And so he uses the example of Abraham. He says, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. The scriptures say, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. 
You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteousness for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies, sent them off in a different direction. A reference to Rahab is found in the book of uh, Joshua right before the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. But just sticking with Abraham, for instance, Abraham, you see in this example that's given to us of Abraham, it says that his faith and his actions were working together. The word working together is the, is the, is the Greek word synergy. It, 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 it means that these are, these are things that are coming together. So his faith and his actions came together. It says that his faith was made complete. In other words, his faith matured. What's interesting, and maybe for you, uh, you know, those uh, students of the scriptures here, when it says that uh, in, the, in the text before us here in, uh, in verse uh, 22, you says, where it says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, his faith was made complete. The scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. When it says that his faith was fulfilled, what it's saying there is that his faith was made complete. And the reason for that was when God declared, listen, when God declared Abraham as a righteous man, if you go back in the, in the book of Genesis, it says that in, act, in uh, Genesis chapter 15. It, tells, it, it says that of Abraham after God had given him his covenant, that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And when God gave this covenant to Abraham, it says of Abraham that when God said it, he believed it. He believed that God was going to do what he said. And then the Bible says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That was Genesis 15. Genesis 22 is when Abraham offers up Isaac. It was 25 years before Isaac would be born. And we don't know exactly the age of Isaac, but he seems to be a young boy, so you could add another 10 on to that. So he's somewhere around 30 to 35 years. when he's willing to to follow God in in this test of his faith here. And the Bible says that Abraham always believed that God was going to raise him back. And everything about the story shows that Abraham never really thought that Isaac was going to die, die. He believed in Hebrews, it tells us that. Says that Abraham believed that that God, you know, uh, would raise him back. But the point that I want to make with you is that if Genesis 15 declares him as righteous, Genesis 22 shows how that faith was not useless. That faith bore fruit that manifested that that this was true. And that's why what I want you to understand is that ultimately, The issue for us is not works versus faith. Because many of you grew up saying, hey, a man is justified by what? By grace, not of works. So the issue is not works versus faith. The issue is between a faith that is alive versus a faith that is dead. And, and the issue then for, for uh, Paul, many, uh, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote about this, saying that by grace you're saved, what Paul is saying is they lived in a culture where people were looking at the, ten, uh, at the, uh, at the law and they thought, hey, if I worked and I did my part, I could earn my way into favor with God. And Paul was saying that that's impossible. That what God has done is God has set the bar at perfection. And anybody here meets that bar? The only one that could meet that bar was Jesus. 
And so Jesus says, look, I took your penalty of sin on myself so that by my death you will live. And so it becomes something of a gift that now God gives to us. Jesus died for your sins. You can't earn your way into heaven. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul makes that abundantly clear. But the issue isn't between works and faith for James. What James is saying, let's assume then that your faith is all about grace. Your faith is settled by Jesus' work. Let's say that that's what it is that you're claiming. Well, how do you know that faith is real? The only way you know that faith is real is if it's accompanied by works. And if your faith isn't producing any fruit from your profession, then that profession may be suspect. And let me tell you exactly. Use two examples. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he looks out at the crowds and he says, you are the salt of the, of the earth, you are the light of the world. Notice what he says. He says, you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill, it can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. No, instead they place it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way then, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and do what? Glorify you? No, it says glorify your Father who is in heaven. So now, if you are a child of the light, if you have embraced Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it says that out of my life should flow good deeds. People should see the difference that the faith that you have is making. And what that does is it gives God glory because people see the changes and the transformation that has been taking place in your life. You want one more example? Jesus said this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Where's the life to be found? In the roots of that vine, right? I can cut off a branch, but the vine still lives. What happens to those branches that I cut off? They dry up, right? It says here in John 15, it says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. See, that's why your works are never going to get you to heaven. But if you are attached to the vine, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear forth much fruit. For apart from me, you could do nothing. So now that I am attached to the vine, you will know that you are a live branch if that branch produces fruit. Some branches, I, I, I remember growing some tomato plants. I had this one tomato plant. It seems like it was prolific. Man, every time you went out there, it was, it was pumping out tomatoes. Another one, it just seemed to just sit there and it produced like this one big fat one but it still bore fruit. And you know what was interesting? Every time I went out to look at my tomato pants, there were tomatoes. I never once went out there and found an apple. I never once went out there and found, you know, uh, Italian parsley. It was tomatoes, because it was a tomato plant. If you are a child of God and your faith in Him now embraces Jesus so that you identify yourself as a child of God, then your life needs to bear the fruit of that profession. Otherwise, we get the warning again. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is what? Dead. It's not a well, you know, maybe for some people, they're really good Christians, so they ought to be doing this. No, no, it's saying that your faith has to produce deeds. And so there is that warning. 
Have you ever had a, a moment where you really just stop to reflect on that for a moment? Because you see, we could easily deceive ourselves like that furniture maker. He probably knew everything about furniture. He probably knew where to buy the best wood. He probably could identify the different kinds of wood, but he never made furniture. If we say that we are followers of Jesus and our lives are not bearing witness to that, then really what is it that you believe? Do you think Jesus is some kind of eternal life insurance policy that you just sign your name to a policy and stick it in a drawer and then when you need it, you hope it kicks in? Look, this is not a harangue because I'm in the same boat you are. I read these passages and I have to sit back and I have to reflect on my own life saying, yeah, man, you're the preacher. Well, how are you doing this? And there are those days when I look and I go, ah, man, not so good, man. I, I should have kept the pin in that grenade before I threw it. I get it. But that's why there's a great word in the Bible. It's called repent. It's an awesome word because it's an opportunity to get another chance. And God's saying, I'll give you multiple chances. But you got to be pursuing me. There's got to be fruit in your life. And you can't be the fruit inspector that looks at everybody else because in a sense that's producing bad fruit. God's saying, no, no, I want you to look at your own life and then tell me what is your life producing? And as we said, faith then ought to be expressed in deeds and actions. And a faith has to be more than just an adherence to a creed. And faith, it says here then, has to be um, validated by obedience to God's will. If I really have faith, it's going to be seen in what I do. So let me close this service by just asking you a couple of questions. And these are for you. But don't, don't avoid the question. Because you might do yourself more harm. If I was to ask you the question about if you've ever come to a place in your life where you have received Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, where you come to a place and you said, you know what, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that he is the resurrection and the life. And I believe that because of my relationship with Jesus, I am going to heaven. So that if you were to die today, you recognize that my entrance into heaven is not based on my goodness, but on the sacrifice of Jesus. If you can say, I, I do believe that. Then do your actions validate that? Because if you really do believe that you are this child of God, then it should occupy some time that you're thinking about that. It ought to make you look at your life differently. It ought to talk to you about the way in which you behave at home, when nobody's looking, when you're at work, when you're in the community. Because otherwise your faith is just something that we're saying with our lips and our lives are not bearing witness to that. And James has just been spending a whole lot of time saying that that kind of faith without deeds is useless and it's dead and it cannot save. That's a hard word, right? Here's another one. If I was to ask you if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, that the scriptures reveal to us something of God's mind and his will for us. Would you say that you believe that? How much time do you spend reading it? How much of your life is defined by that? So if we know what God's will is in certain areas and we, we choose not to do it, this is, this is act of rebellion, but 
if I'm not even opening up the scriptures really very much to even find out what it is that God is asking of me, then why do I believe that this is the Bible, that it's the word of God? And I find myself arguing with people like, you got to take the Bible seriously, but I never read it. What does that say about you then? See, what it says is I want to believe that, but when push comes to shove, I'm not sure I really believe it because I don't spend any time with it. We say that Jesus one day is going to separate the world between those who believe in him and those who do not. Those who believe in him, he says, they're like this body of Christ. They are this temple that God is building generation after generation from nations and tongues from all over the world. God is assembling all these believers. So you could live in India, in Italy. You could live in... Uh, New York, New Hampshire, it doesn't matter. You name the name of Jesus, you are part of this great family of God. If I was to ask you if you are a part of that family and you said yes, then I would be, it would also be fair to say, do you support it? If you say I'm a part of the family of God, then am I supporting that family with my time? with my talent, with my treasure. Or maybe we've adopted an attitude like I did, using my mom and dad's house like a hotel, just rushing in and out, and never really thinking about those who were in it. So it becomes this optional thing. See, James is getting to the real nitty gritty of what it means to be a child of God. It's saying that if you really are a person who is professing faith, then your life ought to be demonstrating that on, a, on some level. And again, just to be fair, I understand that it's just like when I, when I was raising my boys when they were small, it was awesome if I got them just to put their toys back in a little, in a little bin. But now when they're older, I expect if you're going to use my car, then you put gas in it. I expect now that you're going to, there's a, there's a different level of expectation. And now that they're out of the house, I still like sit down and talk to them about what it means to be men. So if I'm a child of God, then it needs to be seen. And we just can't wear a title. You just can't put on a uniform and think, hey, look, I'm on the team. If you don't show up for practice and you're not playing and you're not even hanging with the team, then why do you say I'm on the team? It's a hard word, isn't it? But here's the flip side of that. When you're on God's team, he says, I give you life. I give you the fruit of my spirit. You'll experience love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All these gifts inside of you, your life will take on an entirely new adventure. Your life dedicated to me when it holds itself hand in hand with the world, you will do those deeds that people will turn around and feel blessed and loved and empowered. We're not going to look around at people and ignore them. We come alongside and we help them. We're there to pray with people. We're there to lift them up. We're there to put an arm on somebody's back. We're there for people who feel like they're neglected. Nobody loves them, discriminated. Bring them in, baby, because the church is the place where people respond. We are world changers, but you're not going to change the world just saying it with your lips. You're not going to say, you're not going to change the world because you wear a little cross on a necklace. You're going to change the world when your faith is accompanied by deeds. And when that happens, come on, baby, the world changes. So you look at your neighbor and say, I'm in. Go ahead. There you go. I'm in.